Our first story deals with a subculture of heavy metal music that some feel is sending a dangerous message to your kids. The forces of evil on the dark side of devil rock. And I want to talk tonight about the devil and demons and witches and wizards. And we just mix it up with hardcore and aggression and come out with something that we think is an original sound. Loud, fast, heavy, you know. Well, what do you got? What do you got? And welcome back to Riff Worship, where we answer all questions the riff. Uh, it's me, it's me, the big bad booty daddy himself, reaching out to all my freaks this year in 2024. We're back. Riff Worship wow. is at it again. We did it. Back as always with my co-host, the one, the only, the swindler, and my our illustrious frozen friend in the frigid north, Austin Paulson, who is the scourge of any squirrel that gets onto his front porch. How are you boys doing? <laughs> <What was> <laughs> <laughs> I have I have no problems with the squirrel community. Uh, <laughs> they have their they have their side of the city, and I have mine. That's all that matters. I always tell people how much you remind me of Scott Steiner, Dylan. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Ham shout cubes. out to all my freaks out there. <laughs> is that what that is? I like that. Totally went over my. That head. is ham cubes. Yes. Okay. Well, the. Also, the big bad booty daddy. That's what. That's Scott what Sander I was. Ca- I was like, I had no idea that was like <laughs> a reference to that. So, how'd you guys do for Christmas? How'd you guys? Did you guys score anything cool? Dude, I'm so stoked. I have this new mic arm, which there it is. is wonderful. The mic arm I had before is was crazy. It was so stiff. Every time I tried to move it. It felt like it was just going to fly right off yeah. of my desk. It literally put, I have like this plastic tailgate fold out table and it put a hole like right in the table. So this is far Perfect. better. Love it. Uh, highly recommend. Thanks. Thanks to our good friends at road who I am not sponsored by, but sponsored would love to by. be <laughs> sponsored yeah. by No, I would love one, but great, great arm. So uh, the, uh, 10 out of 10. Have you been, and I may just be a moron, like when I moved from one portion of my house to the other for the office, um, I had that, that old AKG on there and it like is the size of like a brick. And any time the arm would move, that thing would like launch out at me. It was comical. Uh, but I have gotten, I'm surprised I don't have chipped teeth from that thing. <laughs> it, this, these uh, Rhodes arms are nothing to mess with. I got a good present from Will, uh, my former roommate. He bought me this calendar with uh, <laughs> birds oh. with butts on it. It's like a Tina Damn. calendar or something. <laughs> That's, Jesus. This is, this is unsettling. I don't know this, if I appreciate this. <laughs> do you remember the show Ugly Americans? I do remember that show, yes. Just like it. Damn. I mean, come on. Look at all those bird butts. Speaking of freaks. God. <laughs> How about you, man? How was your holiday? It was fun. Um, it was a lot of fun. Got together with the fam. Um, had some easy food. Uh, I had the misfortune of seeing Justin Swindle uh, before it. <laughs> um, but I, I made out pretty well. Like, I'm actually... So, I got this really simplistic looking coffee mug, mm-hmm. but uh, my girlfriend is a big fan of The Office, and as am I. And every time I've watched it, I went like that Pam, that that coffee mug that she's got is fucking rad. <laughs> and so I got she a got, coffee mug. That's but, so specific. It's uh, very yeah. nice. But uh I also got this thing. I'm gonna lean off real quick. So I got this great Oh my god. Like anatomically correct version of the creature from the Black Lagoon. Um that will can it, can definitely it be? Can it be though? I don't see a hog on that thing. Where is hey it? man, it's <laughs> what what is it in shape of water? It's like or so, <laughs> no. whatever that is. I'm blurring that so, out. Can't be doing that. This is a family yeah. show. You know, Kermit. Kermit just went. <laughs> he's high on the hog. So uh, that action figure is called Gill Man. It it reminds me of uh, old Gill from The Thank Simpsons. You. Can you Ooh. imagine if? If the creature from the Black Lagoon was, was just him, a <laughs> down on his luck lawyer, that God. <laughs> the wolves are all old at old Gil, Gil Man. Man's door. Oh, oh, oh Gil's at it again. I don't know who's more depressing, Gil Man or Gil or Mole Man. Oh damn! That's yes, 
<laughs> answer below is <laughs> which which is the far more depressing Simpsons character. And one of those guys is only like 30 years old yeah. and that being Mole Man. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, enough about the Simpsons. It's a it's a new year and we got a whole year's worth of episodes of riffs. We got we got to talk about more riffs in the new year. One thing has stayed the same. We're going to be talking about albums featuring some of our favorite riffs. For the next few episodes, uh, we're taking a trip down south. Mm -hmm. I think this is kind of something we've wanted to do for a while. There are often like regional scenes where you can just say the name of something and it like instantly brings you to a place. You can kind of hear the sound and in Louisiana and New Orleans and the surrounding areas, there has just kind of been this history of down tuned, slow guitar riffs. Uh, I guess you would call it sludge is doom. Uh, there's, there's so much to be talked about in this scene in particular. New Orleans. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it is a hotbed of, you name it, like that sludge umbrella has so many different just uh, tentacles, I guess. Um, you know, it's you got slower bands, you got faster bands, you got death metal, you got grind, black metal. Um, you've got a whole lot of noise rock. Um, the sludge umbrella is vast. Um, and I can't think of a probably a subgenre of music we all three of us probably enjoy equally. Um, this might be a kind of a, a defining one for all three of us. Uh, I think we all enjoy bands from this subgenre, you know, um, out of probably all of them. Um, I mean, there's different facets of this subgenre. I mean, you could even, you could tie in the whole South kind of into this subgenre as well. Uh, but I, I really always pinpoint Louisiana, New Orleans, um, anything down in that area is more akin to this than, than others. I mean, Atlanta kind of has its own scene. Um, even Arkansas has its own scene, the Carolinas, you name it. But New, uh, Louisiana, primarily New Orleans, uh, is known for sludge metal, which is, oof, can be as bouncy and kind of upbeat as you want it to be or as low and slow and as depressing as you want it to be. I mean, you can go from like, you can go from like, I hate God, which is a little more upbeat. If you want to say that to like thou, which is slow and cavernous and this just like despicably depressing music, but it's all so much fun to listen to. It all reeks of like crawfish and <laughs> you know, all that. And it's, it's so fucking cool. It reeks all right. <laughs> I thought there was uh, more to that. No, nah, that's it. <laughs> um, Stinky. So with that in mind, there are, of course, several bands that exist within the scene that are kind of doing their own thing. I mean, yep. yes, Sludge is a uh, very huge part of the history of aggressive music in this area. But then you have a band like we're talking about today, which it, I would consider this more of like a, a black metal band in a lot of ways, you know? Is it sludge? Is it black metal? Is it death metal? Um, this is an interesting one. This isn't... Uh, I, I, would, I would agree with you. I, I would believe that they're more of a black metal band um, than maybe a sludge band, but maybe that's how they fit underneath the sludge umbrella, you know? There's still some of that kind of... Uh, what's the Jimmy Bauer line? You gotta bend the note? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, they're still in this band for sure. Maybe in some of their later albums. Um, this one's a little different. This one's a little more straightforward in your face. Um, but maybe that's how they fit underneath that sludge umbrella is it still has that vibe to it, but it's definitely more of a just vicious sounding black metal record. I suppose we should just get into it. It's uh, Goat Whore, A uh, Haunting Curse from 2006 is going to be the album we are discussing today. Um, this is a band that I first came into contact with through Dylan and which is fitting because you picked this record today yep. and I'm going to ask you about that in a second, but, uh, we hadn't known each other for that long. We met like yep. in 2012, 
I moved to Bowling Green in like the end of 2013. And so when their 2014 record came out, uh, Constricting Rage of the Merciless, we actually saw them perform the day it came out in Nashville. Album release date. At, at the exit in Nashville. And this is like a story I think we've told on the show before in that, again, we, we were friends. We had been yep. talking before I moved there. We'd been uh, friends kind of leading up to this, uh, this show. But we didn't really know each other as well as we know each other now. And actually, we're coming up on like 10 years of that show in particular, which is yep. crazy to think about. But I wasn't very familiar with Nashville. You were, so you were going to drive. However, you didn't have glasses at the time, <laughs> so you couldn't see. So you drove down to Nashville. And in the trying, rain. In the rain. You're trying to have me direct where you're going but I have no, I, I have no like sort of gauge of where things are, where things are, are going to be like, you're just like, what you're like yelling at me. Like, where's the thing? Like, where, <laughs> where's the street? I'm like, I have no idea. So we ended up, we did end up making it to the show. Uh, it was great. This is a tremendous live band. Yeah. It's a very, if, if there is a way to experience the music that this band writes, it would certainly be live. I actually got to see them perform live last year mm -hmm. and it was incredible um but great show uh, a lot of fun yep. definitely a favorite memory of mine uh, i want to ask you uh out of all the records you could have picked why a haunting curse in specifically honestly it was the first record i heard from them uh first time i heard them uh i could have picked out the album that came after which is carving out the eyes of god mm -hmm. uh that would that is arguably going to be that band's classic album i think um but arguably this could be as well. Um, every one of these, this band's albums are great. Um, I've, I've never heard a bad one. They all, they're all slightly different, maybe not in the same trajectory that like a cannibal or uh, some of those bands like that are where there's just enough. There's, there's noticeable differences in this band sound. They've actually gotten a little bit more traditional heavy metal kind of as the years have gone by, maybe a little more merciful fate, a little less like uh, dark throne in that sense. Um, I re the reason I picked this album is obviously it's the first record I ever heard uh, and it's how vicious it is. Um, you know, we're going to get into it, but it is unrelenting. Uh, but it doesn't just sound like a cacophonous black metal record. It sounds like very well structured songs um, and production fits the songs like the whole nine. Um, my introduction to this band was watching Headbangers Ball. Uh, I believe I saw the video from the album prior to this. Uh, I couldn't remember the name of the track, but I distinctly remember seeing the four guys in the band at that time playing in like a gravel pit. And it's just like all the, it may have been a David Brodsky video as well, uh, but it was from the album prior, uh, which the title I can't remember because the, the album titles are pretty long. Yeah. Still are to this day. Yeah. The first time I ever heard this band was when the, Video for Alchemy of the Black Sun Cult debuted on Headbangers Ball, which was on MTV2 at the time. Uh, Jamie Josta was hosting, and I did it. I couldn't really grasp what this music was at the time. Like I had heard death metal, I'd heard black metal by that point, but for whatever reason, I just couldn't really grasp what this was because it kind of has like this very primal uh, vibe to it, this very primal kind of sound. Uh, but after maybe one or two viewings of the video, it really caught on to me, especially the breakdown in that song. Um, as the years go by, I realized, oh, this is a very like Celtic Frost kind of like D beat style black metal uh, with just this great production to it. Um, and a vocalist that's second to none. Uh, that dude's got a sound. Uh, ben Falgu um, has a fucking sound and you recognize him the minute you hear him. Um, but 16-year-old Dylan's brain was racked when he saw this shit. You know, maybe it's it's certainly like consistent each release I've heard, but they again, maybe they add a little something or they just get a little better with each release. And what you know, when I first heard this band, when I first listened to some of the the, the sound of it, I was also kind of getting into Ringworm around the same time. And mm -hmm. you know, I feel like there's some connections there. I feel like it almost kind of sounds like if Ringworm really got into like late like or like you know 90s 
Norwegian black metal and just started playing shit like that. Uh, there's the, there's for sure a vibe of that. They're yeah. they're definitely kinsmen for sure. Yeah, it's it's gritty, but the the production on this record in particular, especially, is is amazing. And you know, and, that, and who that, produced that? Uh, uh, you know, a little man named uh, Eric Rutan, uh, who we are big fans of. Yeah, Hate Eternal, Ripping Corpse, uh, longtime collaborator of Cannibal Corpse, of course, now a full time member. But yep. it sounds incredible. Um, you know, and that, that honestly kind of makes or breaks a lot of black metal for me. I, you know, if yep. it, if it doesn't sound great and I know a lot of, there's a big era of this, um, particular sub where that was the point it wasn't, you didn't want it to sound produced, but even with that, I, I, sometimes I find it kind of hard to visit some of those older albums. Whereas now you have bands like Watain or, you know, Tribulation or, you know, just more modern sounding black metal bands uh, like like this, they, they sound great. I, I, th- I think this it really helps kind of uh, it helps at least allow me to like revisit some of these records. And, and I, I don't hate it. You know what I mean? It's not like, <laughs> well, jarring to listen to. You're, you're right. Like you go back and you listen to like a blaze in the northern sky or a day mysterious dumb satanus. And it's like. Yeah, those are great records, but the production was, and those are probably two of the better sounding out of the bunch. Um, and you listen to those and you're like, yeah, that was an intentional thing. But like, man, you're, you're right. There's some of those early records that just sound literally the, like they were recorded in tin can. I mean, what's the old, what's the old Varg story? What's the worst amp you have? What's the worst mic you have? I want that. And it's like, yeah, I, I get it. We know the whole story, but um you can literally make any music and and honestly make it sound good. It's not like a it's not a sellout. It's still got fucking it's still got like 280 BPM blast beats and shit. Um, you know, it's not accessible music. Uh, you can still make that shit sound good. And this band's prone to make their stuff sound good. Um, I mean, I think their most recent album is self-produced. Uh, actually, no, I'm lying. I believe Kurt Ballou did it. OK. So awesome. there you go. Uh, a couple guys that are really, this band has worked with a few guys that are really prone to make this style of music sound really good. Yeah. And you know, this is a band that's been around for a minute. Yep. Um, I think they were formed in like the late nineties, maybe around 97. Uh, obviously if you maybe know some of the members of this brand, um, you know, like Sammy, Sam Due is, uh, was a member of acid bath. He's br- briefly a member of crowbar. Um, you know, uh, Ben Falgu was a member of, or is a member of Soylent Green, which is another amazing kind of sludge band from the area. Man, that's, that's a wild fucking band. Um, that is like sludge meets grind. It is the weirdest sounding shit you could ever imagine. Like all these great kind of dissonant Sabbathan, Sabathian kind of like riffs. And then it just kicks in and it's just like a straight grind record. That was a fucking, uh, high on fire song title <laughs> Sabathian. Sabathian. he's coming up with words like fucking uh Getty Lee rules bro. bro um so I think at the if I if I have researched this correctly I think Sammy was in acid bath uh Ben was in a, a band called paralysis which was like a yep. very short lift uh like death metal grind band put out a record it's pretty good I have yet to check it out, so I'm gonna have to. It's a cool record. I'd, I'll have to. I'll have to do that. Um, they would play shows together. I think through that they kind of formed a friendship. Uh, ben actually got Sammy into Dark Throne, from what I understand. Uh, he made him a bootleg cassette of A Blaze in the Northern Sky, and this was like almost like a light going off type of moment, I guess. An epiphany of sorts. Yeah. Uh, had a, a like a you know profound effect on his playing, uh, maybe more of like a feeling type of thing. But the whole sludge thing and the whole black metal thing—it's not about perfection and it's not about being exactly on time and playing to this click or whatever. It's about the feeling that comes through with the music. Um, this is a a really you kind of hit the nail on the head. This is like a, this album. It it's it's extreme. It goes so it's so fast, but it also does have like like you said it you know bend the it's note got nuance. It's got nuance for sure because it's not 
yes, it is like full steam ahead sometimes. Like it, it has plenty of blast beats on this record. Um, but there are, you know, kind of slower moments. It, you know, it, it doesn't, it, you know, one thing I noticed too, it doesn't really seem to like repeat many parts either. No, there's, there is, it's catchy. There are memorable parts, but, and, and it may be more so the fact of it doesn't sound like it's the same part, but it probably is. He probably is doing, um, he's probably doing the passing note thing, like in black metal chord progressions, where it's the same chord progression. It's just got a different, like an add nine, or it's a minor third as opposed to a minor fourth or something like that. Just adding those kind of passing movements to it. So it does have this different kind of sound to it. Um, it's it's not just a dyed in the wool black metal record. Like it's not you're not going to get bored listening to it. At least at least I'm not. Yeah. Um there's there's an aspect to it that is exciting for sure. Now, I know this band started out as a five piece initially, but by this point, or at least on the I think they're only maybe a five piece on the debut and then after that record, uh they you know, they're like just a soul single guitar yep. type of band, which is really something to note there, I think, because even with the single guitar, they really fill out the space with, you know, what they have, I think. Uh, Sammy knows guitar, um, like knows guitar tone, knows how to make it sound big. Uh, the guy's got one of the best guitar tones I've ever heard. Uh, he may not be as stoked on the guitar tone on this record. Um, but that guy has some of the coolest sounding guitar tone I've heard on any record. It's, it's a great, it's not overly distorted while still being hyper aggressive. Uh, you can still hear nuance in it. Um, it's big. I mean, he's, he's got a massive guitar tone. Uh, it's, it's, it's just weighty. It, it adds to that whole kind of new Orleans kind of vibe. You know, I've never seen any of those guys live that I've seen. And they've had a bad guitar tone. Yeah. They've all had signature guitar tones that were different, but they've always had a weight to them. And his, he's, he's no different. He's no different. The guy knows his shit. Was it, in a, uh, was it intentional to pick three albums in a row with the, this dude in it? It's, it wasn't necessarily intentional at first. I just know that it's kind of the three different faces of things he's been involved with. Um, you know, Goat Whore, probably the more, maybe even the more the straightforward of the three. Um, in a strange way, it's arguable that Crowbar isn't straightforward, but there's a little bit more kind of a blending of kind of classic rock and, you know, maybe like late 80s metal of sorts there. Uh, and Acid Bath is just a melting pot of different things. But He's, I've always felt Sammy was a very underappreciated, underrated guitar player, especially when it comes to this kind of sludge umbrella. Uh, you know, we know about like Kirk, we know about Jimmy Bauer, uh, Pepper Keenan, even though he's a Carolina guy. Um, you know, we know about all those guys, but Sammy doesn't get brought up uh, as much. Maybe he's being brought up more so now because he's an elder statesman in this, but uh, I would ache in him on the same level as like a Matt Pike, you know? Uh, with this really interesting kind of guitar tone, interesting style of playing, uh, almost un unconventional in how they play it. But uh, the guy deserves as much credit as he can get. And I just felt this was a good opportunity to do that. Yeah. Over the next couple episodes, we'll probably be talking about our favorite Sammy albums, basically, yep. uh, to kind of lift the curtain back. But starting things off with this Go Whore record, their third record, they had previous, previously released The Eclipse of Ages into Black in 2000, then followed it up with Funeral Dirge for the, the Rotting Sun in 2003. So you have those few records. I don't know if you've really, you have much to say about those. Do you have any sort of relationship with those first few records? You know, those are great records, but those are closer maybe to the Norwegian kind of black metal sound. Um, I know in an interview in the US black metal book, uh, Sammy had actually mentioned that a haunting curse was probably closer in vain to the first record because it's so hyper aggressive. Uh, in his words, you know, signing the metal blade was kind of viewed as a sellout thing. And he's like, everyone's going to talk shit anyway. So let's just do 70% fucking blast beats <laughs> and fitting. So, um, I guess my only tie in with those two records really, other than hearing those years later 
was there's a video off of the second record. That was the first thing I ever saw. That's right. So yeah, you mentioned signing to Metal Blade. This is their first for the label. I think they were previously signed to Rotten Records, which kind of ties in with Acid Bath. That was like a uh, relationship that band had had. We'll get into that in the Acid Bath, uh, Bath episode of this trilogy, I guess. But um, they had released their first couple records on that label. Did they, was there a, um, I don't know exactly how they came to be related or how they came into contact with Metal Blade uh, exactly. They were signed to Rotten Records basically out of, from what I've gathered, that was the only label that showed interest. That, that's what I've gathered from it. Um, they were kind of looking into signing to another label post the Rotten relationship. Um, I There's some sort of bad blood between Rotten and the Acid Bath guys and the Goat Whore guys. So the prior album... Um, they basically had already had contact with Metal Blade Records. Uh, the GM and president, Mike Faley, had actually approached them in a Guar show saying, hey, we'd really like to work with you guys. This was touring up the first record. They're like, listen, we owe another record to Rotten. Um, you know, if you guys can hang out, if like hang tight, we'd love to do this. Basically, that the second album gets released. There's already a contract drawn up they just had to wait a couple months before they could sign it for legality reasons. So it was like Metal Blade was hunting this band down and they're like, we're going to stick with them. And here we are, 2024, they're still on the fucking label. You know, they're, they're, they have a they lot like of longevity yeah. of that label. They, there's a lot of loyalty well, there. Yep. Well, once you, uh, if you're in a black metal band or a death metal band, once you're a Metal Blade Records, where else do you, like it, it ain't like you're right. getting signed by Epic Records or something. Like, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's, Right. I mean, that's probably arguably there've been a lot of really big labels in the underground, like extreme scene, but metal blades probably still, you know, in the top five. I mean, that label's got credentials. I mean, the first Metallica release ever Slayer's first releases, Cannibal Corpse, Black Dolly Murder, you name it. Um, you know, why wouldn't you want to sign with them? Um, you know, I've, I've read, one of Brian Slagle's books and just hearing his story and how he would choose bands at the time. They all had to be bands he liked, which I thought was, which I thought was great. I think that's a really cool thing. It's like he generally at least likes something about all the bands that he signs. I don't know if that's still in motion today, uh, but he obviously trusts people to sign them. And um, a lot of these bands have been lifers with that label. I mean, Cannibal has been on the same label for 35 years. Yeah. And I guess it all starts with this record for Go Horror, um, released September 5th of 2006. Uh, I kind of wanted to maybe touch on some of uh, the other releases, some big pivotal landmark albums for bands at the time, just to kind of get a feel for, you know, what the climate and aggressive music is. Uh, Mast- 06 was wild. Ma- uh, Mastodon, Blood Mountain, Converge, No Heroes, uh, Kill Switch Engage, As Daylight Dies, Cannibal Corpse, Kill. And Lamb of God Sacrament. I'm not sure if you guys yep. off the top of your head have any other records that you remember from that year, but those uh, definitely some some big records, some heavy hitters. Those are big deal records, uh, big, massive records. This was during a time period where metal was having a boom. Um, you know, metalcore was really, really big at that point underground. And with that kind of blow up of metalcore, um, underground music was getting really popular. I believe you still had. Ozfest going on. You st- you had the Sounds of the Underground tour going on. You had metalcore bl- or bands playing. You had metalcore bands playing Warp tour. Um, you had all sorts of shit uh, going on. Um, another kind of another record that just came to mind that came out that year is Bleeding Through is the Truth. Uh, huge metalcore record, but it's it also shows too that this was during a period when maybe you started to see an overabundance of records starting to get released from different artists. Like there's so much shit that came out that year that we're probably not going to be able to remember that I enjoyed listening to back then. Uh, but those are all massive records. I mean, blood mountain and sacrament are major label records. Uh, as daylight dies was on Roadrunner records. Uh, no heroes was on epitaph records. Uh, and then you've got, you know, cannibal corpse with kill. Um, Big, big fucking records that came out that year, especially in that era of music. Um, it was 06 was probably at the beginning stages of maybe like 
torrenting became a lot bigger. I know downloads had been around since like 99, 98, but like torrenting had become much bigger during this period of time. Uh, YouTube was like in its first year it, by this point. So you had a lot of labels releasing that. I remember if you would subscribe to Revolver Magazine at this point, back when it was a little bit more in depth, um, maybe akin to where Decibel, what, where Decibel kind of has taken up. Um, you could get MP3 downloads from it. Like you would subscribe to it and they're like, hey, here's the top three to five um, MP3s for subscription. It would be like new tracks from certain artists. And I definitely got into bands that way. Uh, Swindle, do you remember anything from like 06? That was a big deal for you? Uh, uh, just looking it up, I didn't remember this off the top of my head, but apparently 10,000 Days by Tool came out. That's in right. Damn. Uh, and, the, and then you had a band like that debuting at the top of the charts, like going gold first week. Acacia Strain, The Dead Walk came out that year. Karma, the Karma yeah. Bloody Karma came out. There we go. Yeah. Okay, we'll, so that's we'll, right. We'll get into that later too, because that definitely will come back up. Um, yeah, some some amazing pivotal releases from this year. Uh, I mentioned that this band started out as a five piece, but the lineup had since changed to a four-piece unit by this point ben falgu on uh lead vocals sammy duet guitars and backing vocals you have uh, nathan bergeron on bass and backing vocals who was a member for a few years uh he's on the following record carving out the eyes of god in 2009 uh zach simmons also a uh, drummer on this record um he dude was 20 when he recorded this shit yeah didn't he join it like 17 joined joined at 17 uh, basically, the band lost uh, their original drummer, uh, which was um, Zach Nolan, I believe, um, lost their original drummer, put out like whatever form of advert was out during this period to find another drummer. He's still in like high school, I think, and he's living out in Arizona and he contacts the band and is like, hey, I'd really like to come out and try out. And they were just like, all right, come on down. <laughs> I think he he might have rode a bus uh, down to New Orleans. And he gets down there, plays three of the five songs he had to learn. And I think the story goes, Sammy takes Ben outside, says, hey, man, I, I think this kid's it. And they agree, comes in and says like, hey, you got the job if you want it. Let's take it. And Zach's like, can we play the other two songs that I had to learn, please? <laughs> so they go through all five songs three times that night for practice. Wow. And they're like, he's got it. Yeah. And he's still in the band 20 years later. Um, Man, I mean, making that type of decision, especially for an extreme metal band at like, I don't know, 19 years old, 18 years old, and then that's your kind of a weird version of your career for the rest of your life. Yeah. Like, that's wild shit. That's that's like uh, Mark Wahlberg and rock star shit. It's a it's a cool thing. And again, longevity, right? It's it's cool that yeah. they stick with some pretty uh, principal people in this group for a long time. Um, we kind of mentioned earlier, this was produced by Eric Rutan, uh, really he, the name speaks for itself, uh, recorded at Mana Studios in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, you know, what, what a hub, just Florida in general as a hub for extreme music, for sure. Obviously death metal, and then, you know, bringing people from Louisiana out to record, uh, some records I mean, as well. It, it's, it's. It's not, it's not too terribly different. I mean, you're going from like one coast to the other, essentially. Like I, I could see similarities between Florida and Louisiana for sure. sure. Swamp. Yeah, yeah. Swamp, Swamp, alligators, um, you know, you name it. It's there. You know, you grow up in those little small towns like this, this band kind of did. Um, what are the shit you're going to do except getting into the trouble? So there you go. Um, before we cut, before we get too far into this, I wanted to bring up too talking about like 2006 in this era. Um, Jake Bannon did the artwork for this album. Yeah, it is. Uh, I I don't remember the name of the um, the Converge record, but it definitely has like a same similar. Well, obviously it has a similar look just because mm -hmm. the style is there. There's it's got like a similar color palette to a record that they Converge put out. And I'm blanking You're probably on the thinking name. of no heroes. That, that's probably it. Um, but yeah, it's a cool little tidbit, man. He just pops up randomly in different places like that. Yeah, it's it's a recognizable piece of art. I remember going back and researching for it, going, I I recognize this, but I'm not certain that it was Jake Bannon or not, because there's a couple other artists that have a very similar 
style uh, to his that might have taken a couple cues from him. Um, but I was I was happy to see it was actually him. Now, I will say the production on this thing sounds great. All the songs sound uh, like they were yep. kind of meticulously crafted. I mentioned there's like there's a lot of layers of this record in in playing. It doesn't really seem like um, you know, you're repeating too many parts. You're not just sticking a riff here or there. Now, I do understand maybe just through a little bit of our research that uh, maybe the recording process wasn't like the greatest or it wasn't like up to the it, it was a it was a tough maybe a few weeks trying to get this yeah. thing done. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was more of a personal expectation as to why this album was referred to as maybe not the smoothest recording. Uh, just because of you go into a studio, you're like, all right, we already know what to do. We've got two records under our belt. We should be able to get this done pretty smooth. You've got a new drummer, never recorded with the band. You got a producer going, hey, I need you to record to a click. It's really fast, but the speeds are all over the place. It's going to make it easier for coming back, doing punch-ins. It's going to make it easier for layering guitars, that sort of thing. Uh, and hearing your drummer go, that's too hard. And, your, and, you know, Rutan, who's kind of known as being a drill sergeant in the studio, is probably just like, hey, man, it's going to make it a lot easier. It really is in the long term. Um, so, I mean, having to learn to play to a click while in the studio probably is not the easiest case. Uh, also, it's one of the biggest portions of like an extreme metal band is the drums, but right by, right next to that is a guitar tone and guitar. Um, apparently, Sammy had issues with his guitars in the studio. like They just wouldn't stay in tune. So he ended up using one of Eric's guitars and Eric's amps on the recording. So who knows? I would love to find out maybe what guitars and amp were used on this album. Uh, if it's a Rutan recording, it's probably a Boogie and a JCM 800. Uh, maybe it's the illustrious iron bird that he's had for 20 years. Um, or maybe even that old explorer he had, it would be really cool to find that shit out. Um, the guitar tone's massive. It sounds like Sammy playing these parts. Uh, but I understand not being happy, being able to use your own gear in the studio. I get it right out of the gate. It, it really just kind of punches you right in the chops. Uh, as someone who, I'm assuming hadn't heard this record before. Swindle, what were your first impressions turning this record on? Like what was going through your head when you maybe you've heard that first track uh, where the scars of testimony. I wasn't really taken aback or like I didn't click to the f first few tracks. I think the first one that I like took specific note of uh, was alchemy of the black sun. I was like, Oh shit, that's like a thrash song basically. Yeah. Uh and there there were like a few songs, maybe two or three songs that were like had thrash parts. Um uh, so I like took to those more those songs more than maybe the the black metal parts, black metal songs. Yeah. It has like room for everything, it feels like. Yeah. Without like, you know, sounding like you're trying to shoehorn a specific style into it, it all kind of makes sense. And maybe that's why, you know, earlier in the episode, we're kind of talking about like, well, yeah, it's a black metal band in a lot of ways, but they also make room for different parts. It's like not so much this thing as much as many different it's things. It's genuine. Yeah. It sounds genuine. It doesn't sound forced. It doesn't sound, you know, hey, we have to make this song sound like this, which. And I think all of our musical creation, we've probably all been guilty of that. Like we get it. We get in that mindset of like, it has to sound this certain way. And these guys playing together just sounds really genuine. And that may also come from these guys knowing each other for as long as they did. Um, you mentioned, yes, like something like Alchemy of the Black Sun Cult maybe has like more of like a thrash part. Um, whereas like, you know, the first song I believe like it just kind of rips it's in with blast blasting out the gate. Um, Ben's vocals are like no, like noticeably you can, can kind of hear like his range Oof. and like what he's able to kind of conjure up um, hitting like the kind of more uh, classic delivery. And then there's like some higher, like it all sounds within the same like yeah. 
uh, same vocal range in in a lot of ways, but he is uh, he's very talented as a, a vocalist that for dude a band like this is a ma- I said it earlier in the episode that dude is a massive uh, vocal presence. Uh, he's consistent. He sounds the same virtually every record. He, you haven't heard him falter. Um, Swindle, if you if you've never really listened to Soylent Green, it, I I really think you would enjoy the Soylent Green stuff a lot. Um, the guy's also a menace on stage. He's like six foot plus. Um, he is huge. He just looms over the stage. Um, the man's got pipes. Uh, that's all I got to say. And not to say Sammy's got them too, because he's doing a lot of that layered shit on this record. Uh, the high vocals at the end of Alchemy of the Black Sun Cult. That's Sammy. Um, and it's, it is some venomous would be the word. It just sounds very like you can hear the spit in these guys <laughs> throat and it's just fucking great. The, the, before, before we continue, you mentioned, you know, that they haven't really faltered. And I, I agree a hundred percent with that. Having just seen them live and, you know, they released an album uh, in 2022, you know, it's really, it really sounds pretty similar to this. Not to say that they haven't done anything new or exciting, just that it's a consistent ass band. What you hear on the record is what you're gonna hear live. Like, and that's that's the exact uh, feeling I got when I, you know, have just seen them in 2023. Now going back and listening to a record from 2006, I'm like, there's really no difference here. Yeah, like it sounds like they have the same chops. They're playing with the same, uh, you know, uh, f- uh, f- ferocity. Uh, fuck, that's is that a word? Fuck, I don't know. Um, ferocity ferocity yeah that's the yeah. word that's the word i'm looking for hey i just make the ooga and the booga i don't got time for those <laughs> words <laughs> sabathian uh yeah they're still playing with the same tenacity there's a word for you you schmucks um this is a great <laughs> i didn't say anything you did all of hey it. man i'm trying it's... to do an episode of a podcast here if you'd excuse me really quick um hey man it it all it all fits uh, it all fits. Intensity could be a word too. That is a word. This is a, this is now a uh, vocab podcast. Welcome to word worship here on <laughs> Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. Um, one thing I'd also like to note too is that I feel like you could run through any of these songs and it'd mm-hmm. be like a just masterclass on the right hand. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> All of it. It is the way he is changing tempo and shifting riffs. Uh, There's a lot of stuff that you know. If you kind of go through, there's I kind of made notes in in the in the doc, but uh, there are just so many really unique kind of chord choices and uh, the way he's playing. I I think he does do some videos on YouTube where he shows you how to play some of the Mm -hmm. songs that you know he's written over uh, over his very long and prolific career, but. You know, a, a riff like "My Eyes Are the Spears of Chaos." It's like holy shit, and it also kind of changes up. Like, like I said, you know, it, it there's like these kind of slower, almost like arpeggiated parts where he's kind of, you know, maybe it's the same chord, like you said, but he's just picking it's, the notes it's out of different. It. It, yep. it, it creates a little atmosphere. That's that feel thing you touched on with listening to Dark Throne. I think when getting into black metal, everybody likes to focus on. You know the the intensity, the sound of the music, but you don't ab- you don't necessarily focus on the atmosphere that a lot of it has from time to time because it's so simplistic that you do have to um, find an atmosphere, find a way to evoke that emotion. And Sammy's got a really good grasp of that shit. Uh, generally, in any band he's been in, he can do it. Um, bring bringing up my eyes of the the spears of chaos, um, like. Ooh, holy shit. Um, there's, there's points on this record that you listen to it and you just go, there's no way they can like, I know they're not like playing a game. Can we outdo ourselves with like how intense this is? But as listeners, you have to go, there's, there's just no fucking way they can keep doing this shit. You know, it's, it's like watching Mick Foley fall off the top of the fucking cage. It's, it's like, there's no way he can keep going. And he did. But this record is is just like, how can this keep fucking going? How can this absolutely just keep going? And then like, you know, you go to the you go to the next track. That the riff, the guitar riff that's like dead 
in the center, dead in the middle of my eyes are spears. Mm -hmm. uh, that's super fucking dissonant. Yeah. That was yeah. one of the things that I picked out. Um, the next track you mentioned in and the yes. narrow uh, in the narrow confines of defilement again with these long ass fucking titles. Uh, I love it. It's uh, it's got this like really cool, very Norwegian, very dark throne kind of like marching riff. Uh, yep. you know, like pretty early on in the song. And then I, I noted stupid heavy outro riff. It's, <laughs> it's so fucking heavy. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things like I, I, I kind of touched on it in our end of the year episode when I grabbed our buddy Matt and like shook him violently at a Cannibal Corpse show. It's those riffs like that that can make you just go, I'm going to throw a cup at the wall. Uh, I'm, I'm going to flip a table. Uh, you know, that's one of those riffs that just like anytime I hear shit like that, I just I have to laugh because it's like, what's going on here? What are these guys doing? It's just I, I know there's like a case of Coors Light going on in the practice studio and they're like, check this out, man. That might have to come up in the crowbar episode, too. I just <laughs> I love I love a game of Coors Light. Can you spot the Coors Light game? <laughs> like a where I drink Coors Light all day long, all day long. Um. You can hear it. You can hear Cora's life. You can hear the fucking. You can hear the. You can hear the fresh water rolling down the mountains. <laughs> Them peaks is blue, boy. <laughs> um, you mentioned Cannibal Corpse a second ago. Obviously, Eric Rutan pr produced this record. Uh, there's also some Cannibal Corpse history that we'll get into in the following episode in this trilogy. But one thing that kind of stuck out to me was the title track, "A Haunting Curse." Um, there's this beginning where it has like a delayed layered vocal intro in the song yes. right and it reminded me of a a contemporary record uh chaos horrific last year bloodblind was like kind of playing around with that weird delayed layered vocal thing i fucking almost love that like that's song. a rutan production thing Ooh. isn't it interesting huh. what could it be what who could it be <laughs> now <laughs> Um, it also, there are uh, multiple times on this record too, where there's like this kind of bear and snake as well, you refer the, to it. There's the bear and snake thing, which was, uh, I guess the thing that, uh, our, our beloved vocalist of cattle decapitation had uh, described at one point, but yeah. also there's like these weird, almost like I, the only way I can describe it is like a warlock part. Like there's like a yep. guy speaking and it, like just sounds yes. like the most curmudgeonly decrepit person just <laughs> like adding always, to the I song. I always call those like the Phil and Salmo spoken word parts like those yeah. like kind of throaty kind of ratchety sounding uh, deep baritone voice um, I love that shit it, it, it does as you said the warlock vocals I hope that's something we can continue to use um, it's fitting it's very fitting on a record like this you know uh, I think a lot of black metal artist and, and you know we're referring to this band in the black metal sense like they're exactly a norwegian black metal band they're not we, we've touched on that but a lot of those artists took themselves way too seriously like oh my i mean we don't even need to talk about it these guys definitely listen to old school metal like these guys definitely listen to like thrash you know they're listening to do records sabbath records these guys are listening to like old hardcore and deep beat like this is all in there. Like they're fuck. I mean, one of their influences is discharge. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's all in there, but keep in mind, um, I, I want to kind of go back to alchemy, of the black sun cult real quick. The opening vocal line of that is a Celtic frost callback. Really? It is just the, it's the, Ooh, and it's oh, straight yeah. into it. Like the, the old Tom G warrior. Ooh, the, the Tom G warrior thing. And it's, that's all over this record too. Yeah. That's his fingerprints and Sammy's playing are all over this record. Um, but it's, there are just these great vocal cues all over this album. They almost felt a little bit more comfortable maybe doing these things. They wanted to get away from maybe just, it's black metal vocals all the way through. That's it. We want to do these varied up things. We've got a Metal Blade album coming out. Let's experiment a little bit. And that's not to say like, there's a Boris the Spider on here or anything <laughs> like that. You know, they weren't, they weren't experimenting, experimenting like, you know, uh, Faith No More's RV or anything like that. Like this is this is definitely a black metal record. There's no bones about it. It's a it's a black and death metal record, whatever you want to call it. But hearing that vocal variance almost it adds a texture to it. 
and it adds, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Going from soft to loud, a dynamic. Uh, it adds a dynamic to the vocal cues of just like, all right, he's going to scream his head off for 40 fucking minutes straight. Um, there, there's a great vocal dynamic. Um, I don't want to skip over Forever Consumed Oblivion, which was the second video for this album. It was a live video. Um, that's a really, that's almost a straightforward black metal song. Yep. Um, that is a, my God. Uh, just hearing that, I, I think the the video is them, I think it's just a live shot of yeah. them playing at some little small venue. And you can see the type of intensity that band plays with in that video. Uh, but that's where you pointed out the bear and snake kind of vocals. Yeah. For sure. Uh, lots of dynamics, uh, lots of dynamics in guitar. There's a lot of different kinds of riffs on this. Uh, one standout riff in particular I made note of was uh, Silence Marked by the Breaking of Bone is like this really cool kind of chromatic riff that yeah. almost sounds like you need to like do the uh, the Dave Mustaine, the Mustaine thing, the spider chord in order to play it. But I was like listening to that and I had to like restart. I'm like, oh, my God, this is like he's one of these. It's. The way the 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 speed at which he's playing it and yeah, that that riff is kind of a standout uh, riff on the album for me. Another um, kind of. Uh, well, that's got that's a song that's got that big fucking breakdown in the bridge, isn't it? Yeah, dude. That was another part where I was like, again, dude, I just said stupid, heavy breakdown, <laughs> like a borderline I mean, hardcore is, breakdown in the bridge. This is one of those records you could probably. You could like a ringworm, right? Like you could hand this album to probably like somebody that's into hardcore or punk and they're probably going to find something enjoyable, almost like a motorhead kind of aspect, right? You know, yeah, this is kind of more extreme than any, even on the ringworm side, but you could hand it out and go, hey, there's a lot of shit in here you're going to really like. Like I can hear those, uh, I can hear those air maxes just hitting against somebody's fucking chin, like in a heartbeat. You mean like, Y'all did to me <laughs> because I uh, typically don't listen to black metal and y'all were like, listen to the South. <laughs> what's what's my statement? Usually I had to subject somebody to this. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. Um, well, I mean, with that in mind, were there any other were there standout moments? I know you mentioned a few, but yeah, I uh, the notes that I took were like the alchemy of the black song cult uh, the my eyes are spears uh, in the narrow confines of defilement. Um, the two riffs in silence marked by the breaking bone. And uh, other thing I took note of was uh, I didn't really catch much bass in the album. It was to me, it, it wasn't like super out there, but in the uh, kind of black metal riff of the song a haunting curse mm -hmm. i heard like one really good bass run in that part and i was like oh maybe i should try listening to the bass for the rest of this but i just like <laughs> it's because that guitar tone's so it. fucking thick yeah it's <laughs> it's just it's so thick like nothing's cutting through that uh <laughs> like dude i i guarantee he quad track guitars he had to like there it's so thick and his guitar tone's so fucking big, and it's the fact that they're tuned to C. Like the the whole the whole guitar is tuned down two full steps as opposed to just like a drop tuning. It's like my my god, like how much more dense can you get? It, it's it's my god. It's it, it's like the boxer in Death to Smoochie. Like <laughs> how much more dense? You're welcome. Uh, one other minor kind of. Not a, even a complaint because it's just it, it it doesn't really linger uh, long enough to really make much of a statement. But the instrumental track of Ash and Slumber, mm -hmm. it it just feels so it feels like it was kind of just put there. Honestly, if I if I had to like be completely honest with, you know, my listening experience with the record, you know, it's got it's a really uh, I like the chord progression. I like things about it, but. It does, it's not long enough. It doesn't really like serve any sort of purpose, really, in my opinion, for the record. So it's just kind of there and then it fades out. And so that's it. Like, it's just kind of, hi, here you go. There's like a little. It doesn't, it doesn't take away, but it also doesn't. It yeah. doesn't enhance it. Right. Yeah. Right. So for years, when I listened to this record, um, it, 
I don't know if you, Swindle will remember in Austin, I don't know if you would, but sometimes if you would get a CD and you'd put it in, bands would put, not necessarily a hidden track, but sometimes you could go into a, you could go into negative time on a couple tracks to where like a track would finish out, but then it would have the wind through to go to the next track. Mm. And they would put like a small clip in. I always thought this was part of the track before it for years until like we sat down and looked at it. I was like, oh, that's a designated track. Like I always just thought it was like at the tail end of a diabolical submergence of rebirth. Say that three times fast. <laughs> um, I always thought it was at the end of that track. And you know, it it doesn't necessarily add anything to it. It doesn't take away. It's just like, oh, it's kind of there. And you and I kind of talked off air that maybe it was a runtime thing. Maybe they had to have that. Um, and I know a lot of bands have had to do that. I've been in situations where I've had to do that. You had to make time. Uh, maybe that was it. Maybe it was just something cool that they didn't want to waste. Who knows? Um, but what's great about it is it leads to this last track, which is fucking it, bonkers yeah it i mean it the album starts in a like a, at a blistering pace and it ends so, in a similar way as well this is just a <laughs> fast yeah. blast heavy tremolo picking heavy like motherfucker of a song i avenge myself the final track on this uh 11 song album essentially um great song love the song your notes just say fast i have a notebook that i just jot shit down I literally wrote in the biggest letters possible fast as fuck <laughs> just because it's like God almighty, you know, it starts, the album starts fast. Yeah. No bones about it. It ends at the same fucking speed. Mm -hmm. It's just like, my God, it's, I, I don't necessarily know what I could compare it to just with how it ends. Cause usually, you know, like classic metal records of any sort typically will fade end with kind of a longer track and kind of like, uh, peaks and valleys in it, right? You know, um, it'll kind of fade out, almost like a side B thing, an A side, a B side thing. Um, they weren't fucking around. They they just, there was no fucking around with this. They knew what they were doing. Uh, they wanted to, Sammy, I believe, just stated he wanted to be the most extreme band and he wanted to get to the most extreme again. And I, I, I give them credit. I think they did it. Um, and it's a short record. It's short. It's under 40 minutes. It's it just fucking ends. Dude. That was it's <laughs> like a it, it's like a car. It's like a car going 90 miles an hour driving into a brick yep. wall and then it just stops. Done. That was my favorite thing that you said while we were doing prep for this was like, I like how this album just fucking ends and not. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that it's a bad record, but the, no. just the abruptness of like it. it's just done. And it always, you know, it's like a fucking universal monster movie. It's like, ah, <laughs> monster's dead, I, done. I was, what? Well, there's no more story. You don't need anything more. It's just I was going to make over. a Carpenter <laughs> reference. I was going to be like, it's like Carpenter shooting a kid. It's just, <laughs> bat, just right. over. Slug to the chest. You don't need that ice cream anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, is, you know, great, great record. Yeah, it's only like 40 minutes long. That's. That's why I suggested this record too. Is I I know Swindle's not the biggest black metal fan at all, and I went. There's got to be something I can find that would like bridge the gap of like. There's got to be something that's non hateful, um, that has to be a really good, well done record, time wise, song wise. And I went, fuck, you know, we're all into like sludge and stuff. It's like fucking goat horror record. It's gonna be perfect. Well, that's kind of. Sludge in general uh, kind of bridges the gap on all of our interests mm -hmm. in absolutely uh, like the Black Sabbath riffs and like black metal, death metal, hardcore. It does. It's a melting pot. It really is kind of like the perfect subgenre. Like it really like, you know, I was very much into thrash growing up. But hey, here's this thing that kind of can be at the same speed at times, but also have the dynamics of yeah. other genres and everything. Uh, one thing I'd like to note as we kind of wind down the episode is that, uh, like we mentioned, this band had signed to a new, signed to a new label. They had some fresh blood in the band. Uh, you know, maybe they had something to prove they wanted to write, you know, the extreme, the most extreme record possible. Um, so, you know, I think you also want to make a statement by touring probably as hard as you can. Uh, going out there and 
really, you know, playing these songs for as many people as you possibly can. Uh, this band has never slowed down. I feel like they tour just as hard now as they did back then. And you kind of look through this list of some of the uh, tours that they were a part of. I don't think this band was ever home one time, <laughs> like in in the entire year of 2006. Uh, one of the earliest uh, tour packages that I found, High on Fire, Goat Whore, Watch Them Die. This was from like the end of March into early May. It was a U.S. tour. So they played two shows with Emperor in L.A. It was July 16th and 17th of 2006. This may have been their last couple L.A. shows. Uh, one of the members actually had some problems with the visa. So couldn't even yeah. play those shows. I think they eventually did come back the following year and played a handful of dates in 2007. But that band, as we know from last year, they they hadn't played since 2007. Uh, they yeah. played maybe their first U.S. tour uh, in 2023 and, and mo- many, many years. Um, then they were on a tour with Venom uh, late August into early September of 2006. Venom at this point had not made an appearance in the States since 97. Uh, they played a one-off date at the Milwaukee Metal Fest that year. Then they went on tour with Celtic Frost. This was a part of a two-month tour. I think they only played the, uh, it was like October till the end of the tour in November. Uh, Celtic Frost was uh, celebrating the release of Monotheist. Monotheist. Yeah, and that was like their first record in like 13 years at that point. It was released that's, on us. That's their last record yeah, as so, well. Um, so they did that. That was like over a three month period with the dates on the Venom tour and the Celtic Frost tour. As we mentioned earlier in this episode, Cattle Decapitation had re- recently released Karma Bloody Karma. You should definitely check out some of the the deep dive stuff that we did on that album. But that album basically dropped in July of 2006, and they went on their first headlining tour ever of the United States. So. Um, I think Goat Horror replaced the band, perhaps Dog Fashion Disco, and then they played with like Layer of the Minotaur, and they had like this huge, you know, yeah, it's a I don't I don't know anything who about the, that band. Who the I, fuck is Dog Fashion? I, I was Disco? gonna ask, like, I don't want to like shit on this band I've never heard, but like, I I don't even remember reading or hearing anything about that band. I I, I saw an article that said that they were replacing this band on the tour. I don't know if that's true, but. That's what I heard. I looked it up just to make sure that I wasn't fucking like, is this some made up shit from the, the blabbermouth comments or lamb goat comments from wow. back in the day? Like, yeah. So that apparently happened. It was a huge, huge tour. <laughs> anyway, did you, <laughs> did you find it? I think they broke up. That's why they weren't. Oh, okay. It says they broke up in two, uh, 2007. So oh, maybe. Okay. there you go. There you go. Dog will hunt. <laughs> you know it's he- hearing it's remarkable to hear that a band could sustain itself touring that much during an era like this um but it also shows too the, the caliber of the band and the caliber of the record that was released that they could tour that much you know they were getting their feasibly their heroes to go like hey we want you to come play our shows you know yeah. You've got Emperor doing return dates. You've got Venom. You've got Celtic Frost, who, as I said many times in this episode, is all over this record. Mm-hmm. Uh, this band has been touched multiple times by Tom Gabriel Fisher. Um, Gross. And Don't do that. Take it however you want it. Um, Gross. Come on, Tom. He's, Be he's all over this record. Um, his influence is, is in Sammy's playing to this day. Um it, I mean, could you imagine going through that coming off of like, I'm assuming a bad relationship with Rotten Records, which is very evident um, and signing to Metal Blade Records, which everybody hopes that it works out. Everybody hopes that when they sign to a bigger label, it works out. It fucking did. Here we are. What? 15, almost 20 years later, they're still signed to the label, um, putting out top notch fucking records again. Um and touring with whoever and whoever they want and whenever they want, which is all the time. Um, if you got a chance to see this band, don't let the name like throw you off. It's a fucking great band. Um, 
it's arguable that the name, I'm, I'll touch on this real quick. I don't know if it's a joke, an inside joke, whatever it is. There's also some illusion that it was an Aleister Crowley um, kind of thing. Um, don't let the name fool you. It's a fucking great band. Uh, it, it's This is one of those bands you can sit back, go to a show, like have a couple Coors Lights, uh, and just fucking bang your fucking head. I... Uh... Really quick, I think after that show that we went to that I talked about at the beginning of the episode, I like bought a bottle opener keychain and I had it mm-hmm. on my keys forever uh, until it basically broke. And I remember I worked at a cell phone store and just Perfect. had my keys on the, like the table while I was helping somebody. And this lady in in like, you know, the thickest Southern accent possible, just like, what in the heck is a goat whore? And I'm like, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Have to explain that. Um, but yeah, great record. Great pick, Dylan. Um, check it out if you haven't already. Check out their most recent record uh, as well. And uh, yeah, go see this band live if you have the chance. All right. Um, Rex? Rex? Oof. I only have one. But, yeah, so. it's been a rough week. <laughs> yeah. I had to go back and look. Yeah. Um. Since Christmas, I barely listened to much shit at all. I'm going to do a Spectral Voice song and the album that's coming out. Good call. I'm probably just going to touch on the Holder release. Okay. Yeah. You're always touching. Everybody's touching. (laughs) Get those hands out of there. Oh, see. I guess I'm I'm going to. I'm recording that, Dylan. I'm I'm going to. I'm going to make a video. Where you, Dylan was like, it's just all my hand movements. Well, it's that, and then Dylan was like, you you said something about uh, in, for the next episode, you got some hot takes or whatever. And I'm like, my first thought was like, I'm gonna just gonna out of context pull a bunch of d- clips of you saying like random words and then compile it together and be like, see, look, look at this piece <laughs> of shit, like <laughs> problematic, problematic. See, Dylan. I knew it, I knew God it from it. the start. <laughs> this guy's touching people. He's <laughs> watching other people touch people. The sick free touching me, touching, touching you. you. White people love some Neil Diamond. <laughs> I want to party with you, Neil. I want to party with you, Neil. <laughs> I watched that movie again recently. That Great movie. movie. I fucking I told Austin while he was talking about um, watching it. For some reason, that became a staple reference in the house and <laughs> the Cabell houses. We would just all me, me and Will especially would just reference fucking God <laughs> saving Silverman so frequently. I, I, I hadn't seen it probably for 15 years, but I would just pop off with a fucking reference out of nowhere. God. <laughs> oh, you didn't kill her. There was a part where they escape out of jail and yes. he's driving. They're driving the car and there's like a cop behind them, but like not chasing them whatsoever. He's like, oh, my God, we've been spotted. <laughs> He's just like it drops out of the back. Oh, I love-, I love the low hanging fruit in that movie when the coach gets out of jail, comes in and they're like, our toilet's broken. He's like, it's all right. And he grabs <laughs> the nearest piece of mail and just like tests its strength, stretches out. And he's just crouched in the front yard. <laughs> That's his uh, best role he's ever been I in. Love, yeah, that's true. That 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 rivals uh, Full Metal Jacket. Some say it's better. Uh, people often yeah, compare I those. Say, I would too. I would say <laughs> Some people often compare those two movies together. <laughs> um, <laughs> damn. Um, all right, I'm good. We've reached that part of the episode where we like to recommend some of the things that we've been listening to. Um, it's kind of a hard time this month with you know not a lot of things coming out and you know maybe it's dried up a little bit but uh we've got some stuff on the way some albums that have been announced uh my pick my recommendation for the week is the uh new spectral voice single uh this is like a death do metal band uh it's kind of made up of some members of blood incantation and as well as black curse uh they have a new album coming out uh on dark descent i think also napalm records is maybe handling like the worldwide distribution on that but that sounds about right sophomore album uh they just released a single called red feast condensed into one it's a 12 minute song uh, for a first single uh the album which i will probably butcher here uh uh, sparagmos in my yep that's hey if if zoom (laughs) thinks i pronounce it right that's good enough for me sparagmos sparagmos um 
This album is going to be dropping on February 9th. Uh, check out the single. I really liked it. So that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm bringing to the table this week. So how many dudes do you think play Iron Birds in that band? <laughs> Look at the hairline. <laughs> but, Look, yes. <laughs> Look at the hairline. You'll figure Look at it the hairline. out. Uh, every one of them, even the drummer, probably. <laughs> per- per- God, I, I already picture it in my head. It's just, it's perfect. It's so, our- what you've been listening to there, Pop Pop? Uh, I sent uh, I sent it to you all just yesterday, but um, I just found this album called The Auger by a band named Day Job. Uh, it reminds me of shellac or uh unsane type uh maybe i don't know post rock rock like i don't amphetamine know amphetamine reptile kind of stuff like jesus lizard shellac of north yeah. america Sorry. <laughs> i always have to do that every time i hear that band apparently uh this record was recorded by shibby from nashville uh who's in third face and uh Yaucha. dude what a what a guitar player, I guess, and also drummer. Uh, that dude rules. Yeah, uh, but it's good stuff. I like it a lot. So uh, I've, again, got one thing. You you hit the nail on the head with it being, you know, kind of a weird time for releases. Uh, I think we're just all going back and re-listening to some of the releases that are coming out in the next couple months. Uh, I know we've touched on this before, but uh, I went back and listened to the newest Holder. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I hope I'm touching on pronouncing that word right. Can't keep um, doing that. How many times I got to teach you this lesson, old man? I, <laughs> I do love the young people. Um, but I want to touch on the newest Holder single, which is Vessel of Suffering, coming off their new album, Versus an Oath, that will be out on 20 bucks spin. Uh, great track. You know, I, I can't really mince words on this. Uh, check that shit out. It's going to be a good 2024 is going to be a good year for new shit. I'm I am so stoked for that record in particular. I'm especially mm-hmm. stoked for next month, that Decibel magazine tour uh, that they're going to be headlining as well. Necrofire, Devil's Blood. Um, who am I missing? Worm. Oh, I'm, that's oh. good. Unreal. And I don't I think the Chicago dates in February. So I'm going to be looking forward is- to that. Is that tour coming anywhere near us, Dylan? Dylan, in- kiss my ass, old man. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> you want to you want to drive to Atlanta again, Swindle? We'll check it out. We'll just listen. Fuck. To- <laughs> I annoyed the shit out of Swindle one time. We we drove to see the Braves at the old stadium. I think Turner Field, right? Turner Field. And uh, I think I listened to classic rock radio the entire way there and back. And he was so upset how many how many times did you hear uh you know peaceful uh, one feeling. of the one of these nights by the eagles <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> i don't i we were in another person's car that's that we had to uh we had to listen to the radio i didn't have oh, uh damn I didn't my know. ipod that's or something right like I, I just car were you in lord voldemort oh all right yeah well, that's it for us this episode. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this week on Riff Worship. Uh, 2024 is the year of new shit, and we'll have some new episodes for you talking about our favorite albums, our favorite riffs. Maybe we'll have some guests this year. Uh, we got some things in the works that we're very excited about. But uh, as the first episode of this, I guess, Sammy Duet trilogy, I guess we're going to call it at this point. Uh, this is a great pick, Dylan. Follow us at Distortion891 for more updates on this show, as well as our live show that's going to be ending at some point this year uh, in 2024, but we're still cooking. We got a Riffs on Repeat playlist. Uh, yeah. Got big shit coming. It's going to be fun. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>